Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage your 2012 AAPC president, Dale Immons. First, let me apologize for being a few minutes late getting started here. Uh, I think we're doing pretty good, Doc. We've been here since Tuesday, and we're only about 15 minutes late. That's not bad, right? <laughs> Especially for a bunch of political consultants. <laughs> uh, I'd like to ask, uh, how, many, how many of you all had any different, did anybody have any late flights getting in besides Denise? I, I think there were two or three people who did. But one of our sponsors uh, was, was, didn't get to be here in, in the intended spotlight on on Monday, or the first night of our conference, and uh, I'd like to ask Denise if he would come up and uh, take it over from here. Call, call Fire, CEO, founder. Thanks, Dale. Uh, first, I'd like to say thanks to Dale and Elena. If everyone can give them a hand, they've been great. Uh, so, uh, like Dale said, I'm the founder of Call Fire. We're a cloud telephone company. A lot of you probably heard of us, most of you probably haven't. Uh, we're essentially a text messaging platform, voice broadcasting platform, and virtual call center platform. We're kind of the new kids on the block. We're just getting to know the political space, but we've received a pretty warm welcome from you guys over the last three or four years, uh, so we're getting more involved. Um, but uh, we're really excited to be here. Uh, call Fire itself, we're, we're just a group of technologists. We like to build really cool tools, uh, but what's interesting is that you guys are the actual educators. The, uh, the consultants are the ones that are going out and telling these campaigns, telling these candidates what technologies are trending, what's working, what isn't, and all of you are the ones responsible for disseminating knowledge and actually educating. They're not going to the RNC, they're not going to the DNC to find out who the next Twitter is, who the next Facebook is. They're looking for you guys to have your ears to the ground, figure out what's working and, and get it out there. So I'm excited to be talking to all of you. Um, and I'm excited to be introducing our next speakers who are, who are very interesting. Uh, but in light of that, and from the perspective of a technologist, I wanted to talk about just a handful of tools that we see being really disruptive uh, from a technology perspective uh, in, in this market. Uh, the first is uh, Electioneer. It's an app out of Stanford Engineering. It's one of the most sophisticated mobile canvassing and, uh, and predictive dialing apps I've ever seen. Um, and I've actually built a predictive dialer from scratch. Uh, this app actually allows real-time feedback from any campaign via API, and uh, it essentially allows anybody on the ground to be directed either via cam from a canvassing standpoint or from a predictive dialing standpoint to the most valuable voter at that moment in time. And it's a very interesting application. I encourage all of you guys to write these URLs down and at least do a little bit of research on all of them. Again, that's electioneer.com. The second is, uh, is an application that I believe most of you have heard about now that you've come to this conference. It's called Nation Builder. Um, founders Joe Green and, and Adriel, you've probably met them, they're walking around. Um, very, very, again, sophisticated user experience around the idea of managing all components of your campaign. So everything from email to social, you name it, they've got it all under one roof. I truly think this is one of those tools that has the potential to revolutionize the way campaigns are run. Uh, the last is, uh, is an app that actually I'm helping to launch called Hello. Uh, Hello is, is a tool for influencers that allows them to use their actual voice to engage their constituents. So originally, we built it for celebrities, for NBA stars, and so forth to talk to their followers very casually. We quickly found that, uh, that the candidates were very interested in using it as well. Um, and so. You can imagine, for example, uh, when we watched that video of James Carvel giving that speech, if he were able to record what he said, beyond just the people in the room being able to hear it, he would be able to record what he said and send it out to all of his constituents around the United States instantly. It's a free app, it runs on Android and iPhone, and it's, we're basically dubbing it Twitter for Voice. So we're hopefully, hopefully look forward to that launching in about a month, and, uh, and we'll hopefully get some candidates out there. If you wanna get your candidate on the early beta, it's hallow.me, you can sign them up there. Uh, but as a techie, really all I wanted to do is to encourage what I see more of in the private sector than I do in this sector, which is innovation. I encourage all of you to look at what's new as the educators, look at what's trending, 
and, and be the innovators in your industry. If, you know, if, if you're encouraging innovation, that's the only way we're going to create a lot of change. And without further ado, I'd like to give the mic back and introduce the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Call Fire. It's my, uh, my great pleasure to uh, uh, introduce our next speaker, but before I do that, I want to tell you that this, this uh, session is sponsored by Metro Iowa Plus. An AAPC partner for many years, Metro Iowa Plus and its placement service, CNA, offer one contact newspaper ad placement. Uh, to uh, get more information, please contact Tom, why don't you stand up? A very nice man, Tom Small, for a quote, and he can help you out. Uh, this next speaker is great. Some of you may have seen uh, him on, in a TED talk. Uh, Eli Pariser is a pioneering online uh, political organizer. He led Move On from 2003 to 2009. He wrote the New York Times bestseller, The Filter Bubble, Bubble a very provocative uh, and entertaining book, and is now the CEO of a new venture, Upworthy. Without uh, further ado, Eli Pariser. Clicker. Well, um, let's do this without the clicker. Um, hi, everybody. So I'm Eli Pariser, and uh, I am here to talk a little bit about how the personalized web is changing how information flows online. What that means for us as political messengers trying to get the message out about a candidate or a cause. Uh, and then some experiments that I've been running that are really interesting that get at how uh, you might be able to communicate with a lot of people uh, in this very personalized, targeted world. So uh, if we can go to the first slide. You know, my uh, experience begins uh, on Facebook. And uh, let's let the slides catch up. Somebody have the, uh... great. Where? Yeah, we need the, ah, here we go, great. So. Uh, my story begins uh, on Facebook, as many stories do these days. And um, on this particular day that I logged on, uh, I, uh, I had just gone on uh, through this effort to reach out to people who didn't think like me politically. I really wanted to hear uh, what conservatives and what libertarians and what other folks were posting about. Um, and so when I logged on, on this particular morning, I fully expected that my Facebook page would look something like this, all of the liberals and conservatives happily chattering uh, away together. Um, but as it turned out, it didn't look like this. Uh, as it turned out, Facebook had been watching my behavior on the site. It had been looking at which links I had clicked on and which ones I hadn't, which people I had had conversations with, even which photos I was looking at. And Facebook had decided that although I said I was interested in uh, hearing from everybody, actually I was much more interested uh, from my behavior in the friends that thought like me than the friends that thought differently from, from me. And so uh, just like that, it, it uh, censored my Facebook feed, basically, and, and my conservative friends disappeared. So um, this got me interested. You know, I take Facebook seriously. This is a medium that now touches uh, nearly one in every 14 human beings on Earth. And if this is the way that people are getting an increasing amount of their uh, political content and information, you know, we really need to pay attention to these uh, effects in terms of the valence of the data that we're seeing. Um, and then I got even more interested when it turned out that Google uh, is in many ways doing a very similar thing. So, uh, uh, you know, Google uh, is now personalized. We don't all get the same result. One engineer there told me that, uh, you know, there are 57 different signals that Google looks at, even if you're logged out, even if you're completely logged out of Google, uh, you know, there are 57 different things that uh, Google can look at to personalize its results for you. Everything from where you're sitting to what kind of uh, computer you're on to what kind of browser you're using. And um, when I first heard about this, when I first heard that we don't all see the same Google results, I was kind of, uh, I, I didn't really believe that it, it could possibly have much impact. So I asked a bunch of friends to Google the word Egypt and to send me screenshots uh, of what they found. So here's my friend Scott's screenshot, and here's my friend Daniel's screenshot. 
They're both guys, they're both white, they're both in New York, and yet when you put these side by side, you don't even have to read the results to see how different these two views of the world that each of these people got. You know, and when you do look at the results, it's even more striking. Scott got lots of information about the Arab Spring, about the politics in Egypt, but there was nothing like that in Daniel's Google search results. He just got travel tips. So the picture that this is starting to, to demonstrate is that uh, increasingly as we move around online, we're surrounded by this kind of membrane of algorithmic filters that are looking at our behavior and trying to predict what we're gonna be interested in and serve up the most relevant information for us. Uh, and this isn't just Google and this isn't just Facebook. It's an increasing number of websites. If you talk to CEOs uh, of the biggest companies in Silicon Valley, they all see this trend of personalization as one of the driving forces of our era. And the challenge of this is that because most of this personalization is passive, because we're not deciding what kinds of information get into this personal universe, this filter bubble uh, that surrounds us as we move online, um, we also don't see what gets left out. We also don't see what we're missing. And what I want to argue to you all today is that, uh, you know, that includes a lot of the messaging that we as political messengers tend to put out there. Um, let me just talk about a couple reasons why that's the case. The first uh, is that, um, you know, this is not a hospitable environment, a, a naturally hospitable environment for our kinds of messages. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg kind of highlighted this. You know, the, the, the watchword here is relevance. And what he said when a journalist asked him about the news feed was, a squirrel dying in front of your house may be more relevant than people dying in Africa, right? content about causes and about campaigns may not actually be the thing that surfaces the most readily in the Facebook newsfeed. And so, uh, you know, and, and in some ways, in fact, uh, for some issues and for some causes, the decks are stacked against us from the beginning. After all, the like button is the primary way that you propagate information across Facebook. But like is a very, is, is not a neutral word. It's a positive word. And it's easy to click like on I baked a cake or I ran a marathon, but it's really not easy to click like on uh, you know, Civil War and Darfur continues for 10th year. So certain kinds of information can propagate very quickly on Facebook. Other kinds of information have a lot of difficulty reaching a large audience. Now, uh, you might say, and there are a lot of people in this room who would say, well, the, the, the answer to this, the reason that this whole thing is moving in this direction is targeted advertising. And that's true to a degree. Targeted advertising can pierce the filter bubble uh, to a degree. But I think actually that's also going to become increasingly challenging. Because what the advertisers want at the end of the day is to provide an advertising experience to users that is uh, palatable and gets them engaged. And so advertisers have begun to introduce all sorts of mechanisms for users to indicate that they don't like the ads that they're seeing and for that to then drive up the price of those ads or to take them off the service entirely. We've begun to see this uh, in both, uh, on both sides of the political spectrum with ads that are sort of normal political messaging ads, but that people on Facebook find unpalatable. So it's increasingly hard to reach people with messages uh, that they may not want to hear. So how do we do this? Well, um, I think the, the, the beginning of the answer uh, that, that I'm really excited about uh, starts with something that one of my colleagues at MoveOn said, um, and it's this. It's, it's that the revolution has to be irresistible. And what, the, what he means by that is that the messages that we propagate online um, in this social world increasingly need to be messages that people are, you know, find irresistibly interesting, irresistibly clickable, irresistibly shareable, that those are the messages that are going to propagate far and wide uh, in this online space. So uh, for the last year, I've been playing with the dynamics of this, first uh, in a little skunk works at Move On, and then in my new uh, venture, Upworthy. And I, I want to tell you a little bit about what we've uh, discovered. Just quickly, um, you know, we started experimenting with how do, you, how do you give lift, how do you amplify content that talks about something that really matters and that can reach people who don't necessarily agree with it in the first place in the social world. And we began curating this kind of content and packaging it up so that it would uh, reach a large audience. So we started with about 20,000 unique visitors uh, to this particular part of the website. By June, we were at about 500,000. 
By September, we were at about 3 million. And in December, we reached about 17 million unique visitors with content that was about um, uh, you know, a political message. And so I want to tell you about this particular instance. Um, the 17 million was due to one uh, video, this video, uh, which features a young man uh, talking about uh, his, two, his parents, who are uh, married lesbians in Iowa, and about the, uh, the, the, the push to repeal uh, the uh, gay marriage uh, Supreme Court decision in Iowa. And um, you know, when we first found this video, it was just sitting there on YouTube. It had gotten a couple hundred thousand hits. But what we noticed was that the uh, headline on it was really boring. This was the headline when we found it. Zach Walls speaks about family. And no one knows who Zach Walls is, and no one you know, is particularly interested in hearing someone speak about family as a generic concept. Um, so we put it on a highly optimized page for sharing. We really tried to apply everything that we learned. And we, we wrote it up with a much more provocative uh, headline. So this was the headline that it went out with. Two lesbians raised a baby, and this is what they got. Um, how many folks here have seen this video? Just out of, wow, OK. So uh, you know, the, the video, it was pretty amazing. We posted it. Uh, within a couple hours, we had 10,000 unique people uh, every second on the page. Um, in the next five days, purely through people passing it along, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we ended up reaching about 17 million people. Um, and those people engaged. Those people wanted to take action. They weren't just passive. They wanted to do something about it. But the thing that I think is the most interesting is that of those people, about a million of them we knew from a survey on the site did not agree with the premise that the video was about. These were people who were referred by their friends or family to see a video that actually they didn't agree with. And I think this starts to indicate how we might reach a, a broad audience. A million people isn't peanuts uh, using these kinds of online viral strategies. So I just want to talk about one other interesting finding uh, that, we, that we found. Um, as we were playing with this, we tried many different styles of presentation for these little viral memes. This, this piece in general, um, we got about 2 million people to come check out this, this little snarky uh, tidbit. And um, you know, take a moment to look at these and guess which one uh, reached the most people. So if you're guessing the one that's in the middle, you're right. And it's interesting to us because the expensive designers produced the ones on either side. But as it turned out, the one in the middle, which had been created by someone who we didn't know online, um, really re reached people. And we think that's because um, it feels authentic. It feels undesigned. It doesn't feel like a commercial message. It feels like something that someone just would have come up with in their home and, and uh, put up there. And so I think um, authenticity is at a premium in this kind of socially shared space. So, um, what does this all mean? Well, the first thing it means, I think, is that as we think about how to reach large audiences with political messages online, we need to think about authenticity. We need to think about lifting up content that speaks from the heart, that's genuinely uh, created by people who, who care about the message, rather than just creating uh, sort of slick presentations on our, our, on our own. It needs to be as much about curation as about creation. The second piece um, is that, you know, I think this is still the best way, uh, or, or, or this may be one of the best ways to reach really large audiences online by creating stuff that people actually find irresistible, that they want to share. And um, that's, a, you know, that's, that's actually very different from the normal political advertising approach that um, you know, I've run plenty of ads that I don't think anyone would like pull up a bowl of popcorn and start watching. Um, you know, we're used to kind of taking command of our audience, and because the, of, the, of the ability to buy TV spots, we can actually force people to pay attention to something that they might not otherwise want to pay attention to. That era, at least online, is passing, and we now have to prevail on our audience to think about things, uh, you know, and, and we have to make sure that our content is actually worthy of their attention. They decide where they put their attention, and we have to make sure that our content actually lives up to their decisions. And so, um, just pull this up here. So I think you know the days when um, we can monopolize people's attention are are, are fading, and um, we need to we, we need to sort of realize that we're kind of entering the the era of crowd surfing, and this is a big shift. 
you know, off the stage onto the audience, into the audience. And it's a, it's a, it's a leap of trust because we have to imagine that uh, the people out there are going to actually carry our messages for us. That's a scary leap. But I think that, um, you know, if we can actually make it, it leads to some really exciting things. It leads to a political discourse where people actually want to tune into it, where they don't say, oh, I hate those political ads, where they're actually excited to share these messages and to stir up a conversation about them. It leads to a more engaged public, potentially. And um, it, it, it leads to the possibility uh, that you know, people actually can uh, get messages out there faster and farther than we've ever been able to do in the past, and with a personal vouch uh, for each message that really resonates with everyone else. I think that's the promise of uh, this sort of social media personalized world. And I think it still means that we can reach large audiences, that we can reach uh, you know, mass uh, groups of people, but that we have to do it in a way that's irresistible. So I'm excited to discuss this with you all. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Want to take, just go ahead and take a seat on the end. Well, uh, thank you very much, Eli. We're going to bring up the panel now. Uh, Peter Cherikuri, General Manager for Politics at AOL Huffington Post Media Group. Uh, before uh, joining Huffington Post in 2010, he was uh, the Senior Vice President and Publisher of CQ Roll Call. Andrew Ruse, uh, the Account Executive for Elections and Issue Adv Advocacy at Google. And before that, he, was, uh, he had accumula accumulated over a decade of experience working on political campaigns across the country, ranging from local candidates to a presidential race. And Steve Klein, who serves as a Senior Director of Advanced Media Sales for Comcast Spotlight West Division and oversees several areas of advanced media, including sales. Uh, before we get started on, on this discussion, one, one of the things I love about the AAPC is that we, you know, we get to talk to the elder statement, statesmen of the uh, political consulting world, people like Doc Schweitzer, uh, who, <laughs> believe it or not, can actually wax poetically about, uh, about uh, online and mobile communications, or as he calls it, the telegraph and carrier pigeons. <laughs> so anyway, uh, to put some context to some of uh, what we're talking about, in 2004, there was no YouTube. Facebook was not publicly accessible. In 2006, there were no iPhones. And in 2008, there were no iPads. Uh, so, so as we move through this conversation, you know, we're cognizant of how fast things are changing. And, and perhaps that's cliched, but, <clears throat> but here we are on the verge of this, on the verge of this communications uh, revolution where we are actually going, witnessing some of the, the problems that were predicted back in, back in the 90s when, when we had the dot-com boom. And, uh, and some of the brick and mortar wastelands that they predicted back then are, are starting to occur now. And, and some of the uh, fatigue in our, in our thumb fingers have actually started to occur. And we're starting to get crooks in our neck and, and after years of staring down at our phone and whatnot. But uh, what we're here to look at is what's coming that will disrupt th the model for those of you in the room in the next 10 years. And that, takes on a couple of different forms. Eli was talking about some of that. But let's start, let's start with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, let's start with, uh, with Andrew. Andrew, first of all, do you have anything to say to, to, to Eli? Well, no? first let me say to everyone else, <laughs> uh, you should all read his book. Yeah. I, I, we were talking before this. Uh, it's a really elegant description of how fast everything's changing. Uh, to your question of, of who's most impacted by this over the next 10 years, I'm going to give an answer from my own personal experience. Uh, Ten years ago today, I started managing a uh, governor's race. It was the first time I managed a governor's race. And that cycle, I lost a race in Rhode Island. It was a race anyone here could have won or should have won. Uh, and I was terrible at it. it you know, six years later, I managed another governor's race that no one thought we could win, and I did. Um, and I learned on both of those, running a campaign is one of the hardest things you can do. You don't have enough money. You don't have enough time. You always have too many options to choose from. And when I read your book, one of the first things that struck me is, the person most disrupted by this is the campaign manager. An already impossible job seems to be getting harder and harder. Uh, if you read Eli's book, it's full of these kind of just great technology insights, but also a lot of philosophy and a lot of big pictures that, uh, to, to follow in that vein. 
Um, if any of you have ever read Plato's Republic, the, the great line by Socrates that we'll, we'll have a just society when philosophers become kings or when kings become philosophers. And what it really means is that, that when the people who know how everything should work are making decisions, everything will go well. Uh, ideally, the campaign manager is the person who's making decisions. If it's not the manager, the general consultant. I'll, I'll pick on Dale. Um, uh, but now it's that much harder for the campaign manager or the general consultant to understand all the pieces. You know, I, I used to wire Doc one big chunk of money and then send out more press releases and he'd figure everything out for me. Uh, now there's so many different venues you need to, to, to understand to, to manage a race well. Uh, so you're now, as a manager, you have to understand all the tools, all, all the different ways that information is being filtered to your supporters, all the ways that you're being filtered from talking to the people that you need to persuade. It's just a more complex landscape. Eli, in, in watching your presentation, you talk a, lot, talk a lot about online ads and how they're, how you could essentially nix as a, as a consumer, you can X out on the Facebook ad and, and some of this stuff's going to be, or is already pre being presented to us. Uh, because uh, in ways that are affected by personalization. Were you, as a TV writer, is this something that, I mean, are you looking past online to TV and, and, and how this is going to affect TV writing or buying? Um, yeah, I mean, I think TV, uh, you know, there's sort of two, we've got, you know, sort of a, a, an increasing divergence between um, the, the consumption habits and the way that people uh, watch, you know, sort of standard TV as we know it, and the way that people uh, consume online TV, and who, who's who's there, um, and uh, you know, already it's very possible, uh, you know, with Hulu and YouTube and some of these other uh, video services to do really targeted, um, you know, uh, TV advertising in a way that will eventually mean that, you know, they. I mean, I think we're we're coming to the end of the. Um, Super Bowl ad era, right, where everyone talks about the ads that they see on the Super Bowl, because uh, as TV moves online, um, everyone will see different ads. And, uh, you know, and it, one of the challenges from a campaign perspective that I really don't, that, that you know, that really is hard is, um, you know, I'm not a huge fan, uh, as someone who's, who's run TV ads and, you know, thinks they're, a, 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 can be a powerful way of getting a message across, it's not, uh, I don't think it's a great medium, but at least, um, you know, there's actually kind of a back and forth that happens in public where people can follow, he said this, and the response was that, and there's kind of this discursive quality. Um, as things kept much more targeted, um, you really start to, that starts to completely fall apart, because I don't know who has heard my opponent's argument and to whom I need to respond. I don't know. You know, it makes it much more difficult to have a campaign as a conversation or as a debate, essentially. As, a, as you know, like if we were targeting, as a Democrat, if you were targeting, if you knew you had to get Republican voters, but you never watched Fox News, you know, you, you were never exposed to some of those, me the same messages. Um, Peter, you were publisher of, of, of Secret Roll Call. Now you're over at, at the Huffington Post. Uh, two completely different models, uh, although CQ has, has changed a great deal. What are you seeing in terms of, in, in terms of that transition from, from paper to digital, uh, from digital to hyper-targeted to digital, right. uh, w what are some of the things that, that you see are going to affect first the of all, people uh, in the room? No, sure. I'd love to answer that question. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me uh, as a last-minute addition. Sure. Uh, that's great. Um, I did knock somebody off to take this seat, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll use He's the He's recovering button. back I know. There. We are <laughs> in the, the game of politics. But anyway, um, in terms of... It wasn't Doc. Uh, but so, you know, what I was thinking about when, uh, when we think about the media landscape and, and in terms of the change that's happening, one of the things that I think is interesting that doesn't get sort of appreciated in terms of the texture of how media companies um, sort, of, um, sort of cover politics is that there's really sort of three categories of political content that I think are important, and each category is going through a certain type of change. And Eli's leading a certain type of change as well, and I think we're doing that on Huffington Post. Um, the three categories are one trade. You know, what's the information I need to know about politics because I want to do my job um, in the political consultant community, but more importantly, in sort of the uh, political uh, legislative activities sort of in the, inside the Beltway. There's a whole group of publications who have various different business models that would try to compete with each other. The barrier to entry in that marketplace is quite low in terms of just trying to um, satisfy two variables at the end of the day. It's sort of paranoia and vanity. 
That's the entire what Washington information market is sort of based on. If you satisfy those two variables, you can charge for your content and you can build up an advertising value proposition. Okay. So, in the, so if that's one one category, second category is sort of we just say consumer political content. So content that is you know th that you're a political junkie, just a fan of this stuff, and then you 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 know you watch uh, you know this week and meet the press. There's a whole group of people out there. And the third category, which I think is, is fascinating, there's a whole bunch of innovation going on there, is activism, right? So the type of content that's going to take you places in terms of take action, move on is obviously a great example of it. There's other, other gr great groups out there right now. So in terms of the political content marketplace, what we're finding is getting disruptive is that because of technology, because of understanding that political media brands, it doesn't matter necessarily those brands, it matters where they're coming from in terms of the content. So for example, for Huffington Post, one of the great things that has been important in terms of uh, telling the story at HuffPost that I've been doing for the last couple years is that at the end of the day, Huffington Post is a technology company. And as a technology company, what's important for us is not someone types in HuffingtonPost.com and goes to it, but they understand that whether it's through search or whether through social or whether it's direct, is the idea is that we understand there's so multiple doors that you're coming to the content, and so that fundamentally changes how that content is going to get consumed, how it's going to get distributed, how it's going to be found, and how it's going to be shared. And that, that really is going to change fundamentally how newsrooms approach how content is sort of generated, how a reporter tells a story, how a reporter's thinking about distribution, and then finally, how a media company monetizes that type of activity. Steve, uh, a, few, a number of years ago, when I, I remember talking with, uh, with Hal uh, Mountchow, and uh, we were talking about DVRs, and there were all types of projections when DVRs, when TiVo first came out, about how it was absolutely going to destroy advertising and TV as we know it, and yet, you're, you're still here, uh, and you're selling all types of ads, and, and uh, things are going well. Talk a little bit about the effect of, of not only DVRs, but, but of these new cable boxes that are, that are Wi Fi enabled and, and are allowing you guys to do certain things on an iPad like you would at home uh, on, your, on your big screen, and, and how the business model has changed for, for a big company like Comcast. Sure. Uh, well, <clears throat> you know, uh, for those that were at the TVB discussion today, they had some DVR information up there. I think it was enlightening to, to a lot of people. Uh, you know, we haven't seen the catastrophe that people uh, thought we would. Uh, different types of programming are watched in different ways. Uh, and from uh, some interesting things that we've seen just uh, along the lines of the DVR is that we can now involve interactive television over, uh, uh, over time-shifted content. And we're actually seeing people stop inside of the time-shifted content to interact with the ad. And we're getting metrics for ads that are actually uh, time-shifted. So people are interacting with commercials you know, when the theory is they're not, they're not going to be watching them. So uh, I also think that lends itself to just good creative. Good creative is going gonna, is gonna to help uh, and catch your eye. It doesn't have to be Super Bowl creative, but it's just good, solid creative that's being targeted to the right audience. And if that's the case, then oftentimes the commercial is being watched. And it's no longer commercial; it's information. That's that's the goal. Uh, and then, you know, just from a um, uh, you know an audience you know, you know usage-based perspective, the second part of your question, uh, you know, we we're we're working to develop technology based on the way our consumers are consuming it. Uh, that's kind of a shift. Uh, and you know what we're uh, seeing now from a goal standpoint, and it's kind of Eli was touching on it, is that. Uh, we know that consumers want live, time-shifted, on-demand content uh, delivered to whatever device they actually want to be on. And you know, TV everywhere, if we look uh, 10 years out, it's going to look different than it is now, but it's happening. Mm -hmm. It's already happening. Um, and they're watching it on other devices, and we're um, uh, embracing that. Uh, and we're developing technologies to target and uh, be very internet-like uh, in, 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 in the process. But uh, you know, overall, we're seeing a larger TV consumption uh, happening across devices, and the take rates being very, is very high right now. Where do we go from from here? I mean, right now I've got my my phone, and, and this is for anybody on the panel. Right now I have my phone and I have my iPad, and I can imagine that the iPad gets brighter and with a prettier screen and and faster, 
and we'll have more bandwidth going to it, and perhaps more storage, and my phone the, the same, but, but what implications does that have on the way that we're going to consume media over the next 10 years? Is it going, are, we, are we going to use it any differently in, in your mind? Sure, well, let me take that in one direction, which is a, a lot of Eli's book is about uh, the changing way we receive information. It's kind of filtered for us. Mm -hmm. and a lot of what we've talked about so far is all the big consumption patterns or changes, but, but I feel like the corollary to that is asking the question, how are people gonna make decisions differently? Like at the end of the day, like all of this advertising, online or off, and any kind of strategy, it's about changing behavior out in the world. If you're a campaigner, that's what we want to do. Uh, talking about a colleague uh, from YouTube gave a talk yesterday talking about this idea of the zero moment of truth. And as there's this kind of huge increase in the, in the total amount of data out there, as we have more and more options, whether it's filtered or not, uh, people are starting to make purchasing decisions in a different way. People are, are less likely to take a, a television ad at face value, they, they take a second look online. They see what their friends are talking about on Facebook, they do a Google search. Uh, so one, to your point, it's why it's so important to understand how people are receiving that information on the, on the second and third look. Uh, but it, but the, the, the deeper investigation is, how does this changing mode of decision making uh, allow us to impact people? Any other thoughts on, on devices. I, I, can imagine, I can imagine that I'm going to be watching more video or more TV on, on my iPad simply because the bandwidth allows for it, or I can more maybe storage, I can store, store my stuff on a DV, DVR and perhaps time shift more, more video than I, I had previously, but that will also conversely allow me to target ads more directly to the devices. I'm not that we can't do that now, but if the consumption goes up, then perhaps we're watching more video, and we're watching more of that viral video on, on these things, and it presents more of a, more volume. I mean, we talked to uh, Rich Masterson yesterday, at, uh, mentioned how uh, they were talking about the scarcity of online video for in this next election, and, and we're all, everybody in the room should be a bit nervous about the inventory as we go into a, into an election year, but uh, is the next phase of this just to try and make sure there's more inventory on these devices or on, you know, online? I think I, was, I would just want to say uh, from, a, from our perspective and as a media company, you know, what, what's, a, what's been fascinating going, seeing how newsrooms have evolved, how media companies are trying to monetize all this type of storytelling is that, you know, we're trying to get to be a place where we're agnostic to the screen, right? So whatever screen is out there, there's stories being told and it's an understanding sort of the value of that um, device in some way and, and, and so for us, you know, whether we're trying to, if we disrupt sort of what a front page looks like, we we're trying to disrupt and thinking through how to, you know, a front screen looks like. And so what that means is that we've got to get the marketplace in a place so there's not these silos of looking at these devices separately. It's content, storytelling, very basic variables that we have to understand how they're linked together and then optimize those in terms of the devices that are in front of them. And then from a business perspective, it's simply looking through is that what are those experiences look like and how can that be leveraged to, to not interrupt uh, the, that, that experience in some way and actually drive, drive revenue. When are we likely to see, the, the, the big goal here is, is uh, for in, in, particularly for TV, is total addressability. We're starting to see that when we have it online to a degree, uh, certainly with, with email, although we can make an argument that sending, you know, there's some difficulty in sending it uh, and, and certainly open rates. Uh, we can make an argument with ads online ads, but, but as Eli is pointing out, you know, there is some difficulty in deliverability with ads that are disruptive, and I want to come back to that, but when are we likely to see TV go directly to a household or directly to a box even? Uh, is that something that's going to happen in the next 10 years, Steve, you think? You know, I, you know, I'd like to think it is. I, you know, I think that uh, addressability is, has been elusive, um, and it's, 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 it's a difficult proposition. Um, I think there's going to be stair steps to addressability. Uh, ultimately, um, you know, interactive television, you know, uh, being being one of them. Uh, you've got opportunities uh, that we're actually, uh, as a media organization, testing right now uh, in um, the uh, the Maryland area and and uh, in in D.C. that uh, is taking large amounts of 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 our subscribers, overlaying third-party data. Uh, and then, you know, addressing messages uh, to particular uh, um, uh, areas. Um, cable it's, zones. Cable zones, uh, cable right? zones yeah. correct. Uh, so the work's being done, um, and I think uh, the technology will ultimately be there, but we, 
think something to ask ourselves is, once we get it, then what? You know, how granular do you go? You know, how much reach do you give up in order to move the needle once you start finding the opportunity to target the mom with two plus kids that makes hundred thousand dollars plus as a household and you know owns a home and isn't a Republican. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that granularity starts to uh, you know become challenging. At what point do you lose the opportunity to to, to have an impactful uh, message? I think you, that's a great point. Can I, can I just jump in on, on one quick thing. Uh, I'm not a technologist, so I'll just make a much bolder claim. I, I think we're much closer than ten years to the technology working on this. Um, but one of the questions is, what do we want to do, right? Like, here's an addressable moment. You know, a first-time candidate can go door to door and say something different to every single voter. Uh, to, to, to your presentation, though, people will be able to smell that on them, right? E even if they don't talk to their neighbor and find out they lied to one of them, uh, the authenticity will never be there. Uh, so there's, you know, there's going to be lots of technical ways or non-technical ways to say something different to every individual, and you're always going to be struggling with coming back to a core message, to an authentic message, to who you are. And advertising, the technology is going to be built around what people want to pay for to communicate effectively. Yeah, you, you like? Well, the, the challenge I'm having with this uh, piece of the conversation is I feel like, um, you know, we're a little bit talking about, you know, sort of TV in 10 years. I feel like it's a conversation where we're, where we're sort of talking about a, a more powerful horse-drawn carriage rather than a car, mm -hmm. in the sense that um, you know, content that is going to be really powerful and really, engage, you know, really work in 10 years isn't going to be just like TV in a different, on a different platform, right? Um, it'll be interactive. It'll be internet-y. And you know we've gone through a series of shifts, you know, from radio to TV that reconfigured who, you know, how politics worked and what, you know, and in the TV era, a different kind of politician emerged than in the radio era and the new, in the print era, you know. And I think we're now this shift is no less disruptive at that kind of core level, where the kinds of the, the way that you present yourself, the the mode, um, you know, really isn't like TV is really. Uh, something different, and um, I don't know what it is. I don't, you know, but uh, I think what, you know the, the sort of experience that got us closest to it was just the very simple experience of uh, at Move On in 2008. Uh, Peter Keckley, who's my co-founder and Upworthy, uh, and I made this little video that was a personalized video, and um, it was the conceit was that it was the day after the election, and that you, whoever your name was. Uh, had lost the election for Obama by not voting. And we overlaid the name of the person in all sorts of funny places. It was a funny little video. Um, and people you know, shared that with tons of people. It ended up getting about 22 million people to, to watch it. Um, but you know, the core of it was that it wasn't the same video for everyone, but it was kind of the same experience for mm -hmm. everyone. Yeah. And I think. It, even that is a very is a very just a tiny inch toward what we're going to be seeing. But if you had to bet what it looks like in ten years, it looks more like um, an interactive experience than like a like a TV ad. Well, let's yeah. go back. Let's go back to the question that uh, let's go back to the statement that that um, that Steve made about about micro targeting. I mean, when we get to a certain level, uh, where where you you know you're hitting the exact target that you think you know you need to to sway an election. That's not disruptive movement politics anymore. You're 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 simply moving the needle enough to move to win the election, um, and and you've been involved in disruptive movement politics before. I mean, would we have had change if we in a, in a, in this kind of micro targeted environment that we might have ten years from now? I mean, is it po is something like that possible, or do you just at that point you just have to buy you know a million points and and, and go backwards? I really don't know. I mean, yeah. it's a really fascinating question, and it's totally believable that, um, you know, that actually volatility in politics goes way. It feels like it's going up, right? It feels like it's even though you have all the advertisement, the whole advertising plan laid out, someone can do the macaca video or come up with a viral thing, and all of a sudden you've got a crisis on your hands, right? Um, at the same time, it seems totally possible that we're moving into a, a much more controlled. Uh, environment in which uh, you know this all can be micromanaged, and it's just kind of um, you know elections work themselves out at the ad auction level. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't know. Yeah, I uh, I remember going back to the DVR question. 
you know, I remember talking to somebody about, well, you know, if we can only, if only we really had good cheap data where we could figure out where the where the DVR penetration was, and we can buy maybe less in those areas, or, or you know, move it to somewhere where there was was less penetration and maximize our dollar. And uh, and this uh, media buyer uh, for for one of the uh, uh, for one of the parties said, well, we'll just we'll just buy over the top of it. We just we're just going to buy more. And uh, are, we, are we heading in a direction where, yeah, all these tools are great, all this data is great, but it's still just going to be so much cheaper to buy more on a general basis that it doesn't make it, it, doesn't make it worth it? Well, that means bigger budgets and, and more money. And I, you know, I, I think that it's, uh, it's a good answer. I, I guess it could be a good answer for someone who, doesn't, who just wants to address the, the issue now versus, yeah. uh, ver versus in the future. Um, you know, I I, mean, I, 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 I I mean, I know a lot of media consultants in the room would be like, yeah, let's buy more. Yeah. You know? So <laughs> you know, the um, more the better. But you know, I, I, you know, to Eli's point, I don't know what it's going to look like. Um, or, you know, TV is going to look like. I, I think that um, the tools, the interact uh, that are, are going to become available as we move to IPTV, will hopefully enable everyone in the room to make smarter buys more interactive buys, um, you know, more impactful buys uh, in, 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 inside of the campaign. Um, I don't think the budgets necessarily shrink. I think they, you know, you're putting your, your money in an even more directed uh, way. Um, so uh, I, I don't think throwing more at it's necessarily the, the key. I think as we look ahead, it's the way television may look in the future. I think we have to think about audience. It's, it's not about platforms, it's about audience. And mm -hmm. how can I reach the right audiences that I'm trying to reach uh, being platform agnostic and you know, having the right uh, ability to uh, insert at a local level, to get a local message out, a, full, uh, um, a national message out into the right programming, into the right content that your, where your audience lives. Yeah, Peter, I, I remember reading a, a book called Stumbling Upon Happiness by Daniel, uh, psychologist Daniel Gilbert. And he talks a little bit at one point about how people take recommendations and uh, dinner re uh, recommendations. And, and for most people, they will, if someone says, yeah, this is a great dish, and the, yeah, they'll go and they'll read the menu, they'll get what they want. And they'll actually, the studies show they're not as happy uh, with their own choices as they would have been if they had taken the recommendation. Uh, when it comes down to content, you're, you know, you're in charge of the politics section, and you have to create content that's appealing to everyone, and yet you have this micro-targeted model developing or in development that would almost seem to dictate that you write a whole lot of politics sections different ways um, and assemble them differently. What, where is Huffington Post going? Uh, I mean, are, you, are, are we in a situation where we're going to have the, the you know, everyone gets a different Huffington Post? Uh, or is there going to be a politics section that we can all go to and we can all share and it's going to be one thing? Uh, that's an interesting question. I, I, I don't, I don't uh, let me answer it in a couple different ways. I think there's two things that I would say that to separate out and, and tie it a little bit to what you're saying in terms of um, finding the audience. So from, and there's a one that's a content experience of, of how news is, is sort of generated and there's one of sort of the advertising piece. On the advertising piece, what's interesting for the, the media landscape um, and, and I think that we're ahead of t television in the online space is sort of the um, robust ecosystem we have in sort of the advertising technology community, where, which has put a tension and it's a pressure on um, content properties or owned and operated properties to sort of be able to hold their ground because on that other flip side of the advertising technology industry um, and sort of the non-reserve industry is that it's all about the audience, right? I don't care necessarily what um, site you're on, let me deliver that audience. When you combine those two things, there's a, there's a little bit of tension, and we have that as, a, I think, an opportunity as a company, and that's one of the reasons that AOL sort of purchased Huffington Post, have a premium property, plus AOL sort of owns a uh, advertising.com. So that's, that's one set of issues that I think is interesting in terms of how, the, um, how we're gonna respond to television or how we're thinking about television, because I think it's already light years ahead in terms of finding the right audience, and there's plenty of inventory, right? So come you know, election uh, time this year, there's gonna be lots of inventory um, online that's gonna be available where television is, has, has a scarcity issue. Now in terms of, to your question uh, uh, on the content side, of like the, the tailoring of information, look, you know, what, what 
and we go back to the very simple things. Media companies, um, newspapers, newsrooms have been making choices about what content people should read and not read since the dawn of our industry, right? So the front page of, of any newspaper is, choice, is based on choices of the newsroom things um, in terms of how we present that type of content. What's unique with the way things are going and, and the stuff that, that Eli's doing is that how do you make those choices informed by other different types of variable, whether or not you're trying to maximize them from their social impact or their shareability, or maximize those in terms of that if you have a, um, uh, a point of view in terms of um, how you think this particular story can get its legs um, out there in the market besides a one and done, then what you're, you're creating is less of the, um, um, this is the, uh, this is what the newsroom says, but you're thinking about what can we get the community to think about, right? So it's not so much the personal, I don't think we're leaning into as a news organization, personalizing each experience of our main page in terms of um, you're coming to Huffington Post, Huff Post politics, and you have an experience that that experience is still going to be driven by a newsroom and other different types of variables of technology that we think is important, uh, the choices we make in terms of what we think is driving the conversation. There are other things that we do in terms of um, from our navigation, in terms of things that are based on um, sort of um, social behaviors that are pointing to different things. But at the core of our content experiences, we have a newsroom who's going to be making choices, uh, saying what we think is important in terms of, in, in, at least in, in my world, in, in the field of politics. It was pointed out. At, you want to, to, yeah. I mean, I think that sort of you, you were getting at this, but the interesting shift that's happening, right, is that already people, because of because HuffPo is so focused on social and so focused on search, already people mostly experience it very differently because they don't enter it through the front page or they don't enter it through the politics section. And so you may say, you know, hey, this piece on the war in Afghanistan, everybody should read this. I'm going to splash it across the front of the politics section. But if it's not getting shared a lot in, on Facebook and it's not getting a lot of uh, traction on, on Google, then you know, you can't dictate that the audience go there. Uh, I, I mean, right? Like, it, it, the, the power is sort of shifting uh, to these algorithms to decide what of the HuffPo content people actually see. That's right. In terms of there's things that um, are, are going to happen in terms of the maximization of that content to be a platform that is based on what is happening on search and what's happening on Facebook that has nothing to do with what we're, what, what, what we're going to say in terms of what we think is an important story. We will take that information and make other decisions about how we treat that, those stories and treat those headlines and all those sort of things have uh, been out there. But you're absolutely right that in terms of there's, there's a, comes a certain point where um, the, 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 the viral nature of the content is dictated by things that are outside of the newsroom's control. Does algorithmic personalization just completely kill the surprise factor? I mean, essentially, you're getting, if you're getting what you want and, you, and, and Facebook or, or Google, well-intentioned as it may be to provide the customer what they want, uh, is filtering this information, does it completely take the surprise factor out of it or the, you know, the disruptive factor out of it, ultimately, it, it, in, uh, your, in your view? I mean, I think uh, it easily could. And, uh, but that's actually because, as a product right now, it's very rudimentary, yeah. um, and so, you know, you're not really dealing with, you know, to do personalization right, you really have to understand someone as a person, mm -hmm. and the data points that that are used to kind of model what a person is are still fairly rudimentary, but, so yeah. you, you lose the granularity, you know, you lose you lose that. But in theory, that's just a mark of like a product that needs to be improved. And I'm sure Facebook and Google are all trying to provide people. I mean, they, they, in the long run, they'll need to provide that su surprise factor in order to make it a more satisfying experience than opening a magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, one point on this is that what we're really talking about, one of the big worries you, you point to in the book, uh, it's not just whether it's the same experience for everyone else. It's like, is there there's some bad impact of this? And you talk a lot about, about confirmation bias. Um, one way to think about it, though, confirmation confirmation bias isn't a totally new problem. You know, so, so we're, you're, you're right that, that there's so many things where I'm not being exposed to other points of view. But I think about my childhood. Um, you know, and I'm old enough where I, there, there was no internet, and I think how how totally controlled my political worldview probably was by, by my father and the the pieces of print journalism he brought home. Yeah. 
So you're always going to have, I mean, and, and the bigger point is absolutely elegant, but you're always kind of struck with this, like, you know, what changed about the world? Are we being filtered more, or do we, at the end of the day, still have more ways to do research? It's possible. More ways to get our hands on facts. So, I mean, it's possible that these algorithms will uh, do a better job of teaching us politics than perhaps our parents even. Uh, I mean, my, you know, it's not like, yeah, this guy's an idiot. You know, that it's actually, you know, demonstrating algorithmically that they're an idiot. Um, <laughs> what, Let's, let, let's, let's switch gears for one second, because I want to talk about the role, of, uh, some practical things in terms of the role of campaigns. Uh, and, uh, as an online, you know, someone that spends a lot of time doing online consulting, I tend to serve a number of different masters, uh, sometimes the campaign manager. Uh, more recently, I'm working more with TV people, but, but as it was pointed out earlier, a lot of direct mail firms are getting in on, on online, and I just was sitting down at, at the luncheon and talking to a, a major newspaper and they were selling me email lists and so it's not clear to me where five years from now who I who I'm going to be working for or with um, am I or you know as the general online consultant am I going to be part of the TV peop, uh, package or or am I going to be part of uh, am I going to be my own entity, uh, hired as a separate digital uh, campaign CTO, or you know, what, 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 as a former campaign manager, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, this is what I was alluding to at the beginning of it. Yeah. It's just really hard. I mean, where I spent money was so set for so long. Uh, speaking of Google as a platform, so we work with everybody in the industry. We work both sides of the aisle. Peter, I'm sure you see this. Um, right now, our, our largest clients are really an even mixture of large campaigns who are insistent they can do it better themselves, TV buyers, regular media consultants, direct mail firms, uh, people who I'd consider more of a, a, a web strategy or, or web development firm, and on the, you know, people who are niche online buyers. Uh, and it's not clear that anyone, they all have different value propositions. Uh, it's, not, it's not clear if one is going to win out. Mm -hmm. uh, you asked me this question last year, and I, I kind of assumed that it, it would, over a couple cycles would shake out and there'd be a winner. More and more, I think, across the campaign, there's going to be uh, different consultants uh, buying online ads for different reasons. Mm -hmm. there, there might be a, a fundraising firm that's doing direct mail fundraising, setting up events, managing call time, and doing their online fundraising throughout. The, the media buyers who are, are the ones that say, we, we understand media consumption the best. We know how to, how to get to a single audience across platforms the best. Uh, we're going to control the persuasion at the end. Uh, and the, 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 you know, someone like Doc, the, the, the media consultants and the direct mail consultants on different races uh, will, will be doing rapid response through, throughout. So, so the, there's be you know, people with different campaign expertise are going to adopt this as a tool for what they're already doing and advising. Steve, I'm going to put you on the spot here and ask you two cycles from now. Right now, we're, right now we're, online's taking up somewhere between zero and 15, 20 percent. Um, mostly south of 10, we'll yeah, south of 10, uh, south of 10 percent most of the time uh, in terms of the overall media budgets. Four years from now, what, 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 would, be your, what would be your guess? Presuming, and I, accepting the fact that the whole model could change, we're not actually defining this as online versus TV. But that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I, I feel like we're kind of in this primordial soup right now, and certain Consultants and agencies are kind of climbing out of it and and starting to embrace uh, digital media and and developing an expertise that I think will get them uh, much farther in those in, in those four years instead of buying and consulting on what the proven is uh, it, like you're saying you know you, as a campaign manager there's, you you know what you buy you trust it. Uh, you've done it for years and years and years. So who's going to be willing to shake up that mix? Who's going to be willing to um, ultimately take a ch chance uh, um, and, and, and a calculated chance? Nothing that's going to blow an election, <laughs> but a calculated yeah. chance to start getting data and metrics and information for their campaign, not somebody else's campaign, where they could start learning and tweaking and understanding and and uh, and, and building from. So um, optimistically, I like to say. In the next presidential cycle, uh, we'll have a whole lot more of digital expertise in the marketplace. Maybe we go from, uh, you know, number I, I typically go, there's about 2% of, of, of uh, budgets being spent online right now. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe it goes to 8 or 10 or, 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 fi or 15%. But I think 
you have to ask yourselves that if you had all the magic tools at your disposal today, as a consultant, as an agency, could, could you buy it? Would you know how to buy it? Would you know how to measure it? Would you know how to traffic it? Would you know how to, to do the things that you know? And the only way to start that is, is to, you gotta begin and, to begin. And it's the and regulatory it's environment there for it too. I mean, we have this, we have, we were it's talking true. about it this, the other day about how a TV ad, is a TV ad delivered online uh, to a you know a Wi-Fi enabled uh, TV, even though it's essentially the same channel. But once it's delivered over the airwaves and uh, over my Wi-Fi instead of my cable, is it now an internet ad and not subject to the same disclaimer requirements? Uh, it's, you know we have all types of new problems that are going to be created right with uh, with this new, with this technology. Yeah, it's a it's a brave new yeah. world, and especially as we start getting more budget placed towards it, then these things will become more uh, uh, more imperative to, yeah. to answer. There's sort of a, a gray area that we're in there right, right now. I, just I think I just want to say this is a challenge in this conversation, and to your question, uh, just what that puts um, for for us digital folks um, at uh, a disadvantage is that it's usually said online, like there's one thing that's online. There's a really rich texture of choices that are out there in terms of online, from search advertising to social advertising to display stuff, whatever. That, and there's big differences between why use one versus the other. And we're not even getting to that place, right? So we're thinking of online as one big bucket of a percentage of a total spend. And until we get to that place where that there is a, um, that we're, when we're at the table, there's enough um, conversation about the different sophisticated uh, technologies that are in place, we're not gonna have actually a marketplace, and that's what that's the challenge right now. So we're collectively online, but in fact, there's so much other, there's so much differentiation between um, those those uh, uh, platforms that we're not even able to, to get to that point. And until we get to that point, we're not gonna really have a real marketplace. And I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna leave it there uh, to summarize, uh, it will be something else it's going to disrupt everything. It's very scary, and it will happen sometime between December 2012 and, and, and get the future. your checkbooks out. Steve, thank you very much, Peter, Andrew, and Eli, uh, and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you to Met and thank you to Metro Iowa and CNA.